Okay, welcome back. It's time for Adam Sandor to tell us what we should do with our container orchestration. Please, Adam. Hey, guys. So, this talk is about container orchestration, and actually, since I started developing the talk, it pretty much has become Kubernetes, uh, because the world has just gone that way. Uh, this is bringing the world of container orchestration closer to developers. So usually I did the talks about Kubernetes for operations people, how do you set it up, how do you use it, how DevOps works. And this time, because I have a Java developer background, so the talk is bringing it all closer to Java developers. Is everybody a Java developer here? Okay, okay, pretty good, pretty good. Um, Today I actually realized that there is a bit fewer Java developers around here than I expected, and I realized that I could practically just remove Java from there and just say developers. The examples anyway have to be in some language, so it's all right if you're not a Java developer. This is going to be more about how to use, how to organize development processes uh, when you're using containers and Kubernetes. Who here uh, has used Docker in some way? Most people, okay. And some container orchestration engine like Docker Swarm, Kubernetes, Mesos. All right, okay. So we're gonna cover the basics and maybe the demo is going to be shorter than uh, it could be. All right, so brief history of server-side Java. As not everybody is a Java uh, developer here, uh, I'm gonna take this quite short. So, oh yeah, this is actually the TOC, yeah. So we're gonna cover the a brief history of server-side Java. Then we are going to look at why has Docker come onto the scene, why Kubernetes has become a big thing. I will try to convince you that it's actually a good idea to learn something about Kubernetes. And then I will show you how to build a Java microservice app on Kubernetes. I am a consultant working for a company called Container Solutions in Amsterdam, and we help other companies use containers, orchestrations, and all the cloud-native world uh, to, their, to their best. So that is what I do, and that's why I'm talking about this stuff. And I'm also a big fan of Doom, so I try to uh, push that into the talk a bit. Who here has played Doom? Pretty good, pretty good. More people than using Kubernetes. Very good. <laughs> For a game that's like, what, 20 years old or something, that's, that's really nice. Um, all right, so this is the uh, architecture diagram for Java Enterprise Edition. And the whole point of Java Enterprise Edition, it was the, and I see a lot of smiles there, old crap, whatever. But actually, the general design idea of Java Enterprise Edition, while we nearly completely abandoned that, has been really great. The idea was that you just write small chunks of code called Java Beans, and the platform provides all the services around it. So you don't have to worry about database access or HTTP servers and all the stuff is going to be provided to you by the platform in the production environment. So operations can take care of all that crap while you can just code directly on the business logic. It's an amazing idea. Except for the fact that it doesn't work so well in, in practice. And the reason for that is that when you are not in control of all these things and delegate all those to another team, it's harder to change them. And it's also very hard to create environments that resemble production. Because in production it might be a different version of the operating system, a different version of the Java virtual machine, a different application server, a different uh, version of Hibernate, which is the database access library for Java, and all these things, even though they have been covered with like standardized APIs and Java Enterprise Edition is a standard and many things, many new programming languages could learn from there, but also they, can, they did learn the mistakes that if you provide standard APIs for two high-level things like database access, what if the databases change a bit? And what if you want to use a different ORM library, etc.? It's so hard to change and so hard to make developers aware of the environment they will be deploying to in production. So what happened with Java, this is Java Enterprise Edition layers. Uh, there is all that you care about is the business logic and 
all below it is provided on the target environment. Application container, ORM, RMI, remote method invocation, all kinds of services. So then a very famous Java library called Spring came along and they said, now let's not put all that stuff into the application server, let's put much of it into my own code, I can compile it, I can change versions of th those things and it will be in my control as a developer and not in control of operations. And that worked pretty well. Actually, it also means more control but more responsibility and more work for developers and this trend is going to continue. Uh, Spring Boot said that even the application server should be kind of compiled into your executable jar file and many more things and of course it does other things also but that's one of the major changes it did. And so this leads us to Docker which is one way to understand Docker is that it's a way of packaging your application where even the operating system or a large part of the operating system is in your control as a developer. You cannot choose the kernel, you only rely on having the, a sufficiently up-to-date Linux kernel in every environment where you deploy to. Which is kind of interesting when you're like running on your local laptop, Docker works really well there, but you actually have to have like a virtual machine somewhere in there if you're not working on, on Linux. So this is one of the essential things of DevOps, pushing responsibility to developers away from operations. Because simply, developer, a company will develop many, many products, but there will be a very much fewer environments, much fewer operations people, and it's better if they just keep the very basics, like the servers and stuff up and running, and developers can take care of all the rest of the stuff. Not because they're smarter, but because they're just closer to these things and have and can test them before changing them, etc. So this is the evolution of software development we have seen in the past years, going and like kind of culminating in Docker. And then actually rebounding back to things like serverless, where you again completely use control and just deploy a small piece of code. But then there are other advantages that kind of try to outweigh this. So, but uh, I'm gonna skip that in this talk. So, then, uh, once you decide that, yeah, Docker is awesome, because it is, by the way, uh, and package your application as Docker images, you will want to run many of these images. Um, so, you put a lot of images. Docker provides an excellent model of isolation. Your images will feel as if they are the only thing. Your, your program in that Docker container will feel like it's the only thing running on that server. So you can run many, many of them and there will be no collisions. Everybody can write to disks. They will see the hard disk also as one uh, isolated partition that only they have access to. So that's great. But of course that server will fill up at some point with containers. By the way, in Docker terminology there is an image that you build as a static thing and then a container is the running process. So it's basically a container you can think of as a single process on a Linux machine, but we call it a container because that process is completely contained in the Docker isolation mechanism which actually exploits uh, Linux kernel mechanisms to do that, to achieve that. There's like a lot of bundling together of Linux kernel features that in the end achieve this isolation. So it's not like the JVM that just builds on top of Linux, this is kind of built into Linux in a weird way. So, you want to run containers on two servers. That's great. Um, I already see everybody writing their own container orchestrator because it's pretty easy to deploy containers to one server. You just need a little algorithm that decides, oh, on that server I have two containers running on that server, just one, and I start up one on that server. And actually this basic stuff is pretty easy, but it gets complicated quite fast. So it's better to use an actual container orchestration system um, that's called Kubernetes. So, in the past few years, there's been a big war of container orchestration systems, and Kubernetes has kind of won that war. It's big, it's open source, it has a huge community, and it's governed by an open source foundation that has been spun off by the Linux Foundation. It's called the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. All this stuff means that Kubernetes is here to stay. So that's one of my points today, that as developers, even though Kubernetes is an OPSI thing, your applications will probably in the future 
with a good probability be running on Kubernetes. So it's a very worthy investment of your time to learn how Kubernetes works. And what Kubernetes does is practically turns all those servers into a cloud that you don't no longer have to care about what, where your, uh, on which server your containers actually run. It will turn those servers into nodes of your cloud and provide virtual networking between them so all containers can talk to each other and you practically don't have to care which machine did they pr actually start up on. Uh, why Kubernetes? No, I want to do a longer demo, so I'll... Actually, no, this, this, this is a good slide. So, why is this? So, Kuberne there is this term called cloud native, which is the new buzzword after DevOps. It's called cloud native, and it's a pretty horrible one. Because on one hand, it can mean anything, any application that's been architected for the cloud. So for example, a serverless application, I would completely understand as cloud native. However, because the Linux Foundation spun off the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and they made a definition of what cloud native is, I'm going to now use that definition, and that means containerized applications run by a container orchestration platform. So serverless is actually excluded from, uh, from the official cloud native buzzword. So now excluding all that stuff and just focusing on what the, uh, the CNCF says, why is cloud native a good idea? On the left side, you see the primitives of AWS, EC2 instances, virtual machines, security groups, which are kind of firewall thingy, routes, virtual private, clouds. All this stuff is super low level. It's very flexible. You can build your fantastic data center out of it, but you will put in a lot and a lot of work to do that. And it has nothing to do with your applications. It's pure infra stuff, networking, low level things, machines, provisioning, all that. On the right side, there are high level services like Heroku that do everything for you. Super opinionated, super simple to use, as long as you either don't want to like go in your, uh, do an on-premise solution, or if you, uh, or, or if you don't care like total loss of control. Heroku tells you how to build your application. It doesn't just run it, it tells you how to uh, build it. It's very, it just has a few ways to actually deploy it. It works great as long as you're doing kind of simpler things and you don't break their model. Uh, Amazon Lambdas, Google Cloud Functions, and Azure Functions are even more limiting. But they're awesome. They have some awesome properties like easy scaling and uh, not paying anything until it's actually used. So that's great. But, uh, but it's, again, very, very limiting in how you do stuff. And so Cloud Native cl comes kind of in the middle. Architecture applications as microservices. Microservices are not so tiny as Lambdas, but also not just some kind of servers that you install somehow. Uh, package them as containers. So one process per container is one application component. Orchestrate them using a container orchestration engine like Kubernetes, and do some DevOps processes around that. And that's a very nice sweet spot between, total con between uh, no control and very low level of abstraction. It's very good to work with, but there is a learning curve. So that's what I'm introducing you to now. So a microservice platform, in my view, and that's exactly what Kubernetes provides, gives us application provisioning and start up our application, makes the network invisible, provides service discovery so that distributed application services can actually find each other, provides configuration management and environment isolation. So I can spin up more environments on the same platform. I don't have to have a Kubernetes spun up for each environment. How does it work? In very short terms, there is a Kubernetes agent. So I have a bunch of virtual machines called nodes in Kubernetes lingo on the bottom. Each of them is running a Kubernetes agent plus a Docker daemon. The Docker daemon is used to actually run containers and the Kubernetes agent instructs the Docker daemon to start something up. And then there is a Kubernetes master there on the top and the master will talk to the nodes and will tell them, you do this, you do this, because the user wants to run their 50 microservice application. So now the master will decide this service goes here, that service goes there. 
and uh, the Kubernetes agent executes those commands on each of the nodes. Very simple, don't have time for more uh, in-depth explanation. But really, it's not more complicated than this. In the end, of course, in the detail it is, but the principle is just agents on each node and starting things up there. One more thing compared to something like Puppet, uh, what's important is that Kubernetes will keep the state. So you tell, oops, sorry. You tell Kubernetes to, uh, to run 50 services in this many instances connected like this and this, and Kubernetes will make sure that whatever happens to your cluster, that state will remain. So if a machine goes down, it will start up all the services that have been running on that machine on another machine. So that's very important. There is a constant control loop running, monitoring your cluster, and making sure it stays healthy. Um, I will, I think, skip the service discovery. Um, 15 minutes in, okay. We will maybe go back to service discovery. But. So first, the, uh, or like the last thing you need to know before I show you the demo, uh, the language of Kubernetes. It's basically a kind of a programming language. How you describe your application to Kubernetes. It's a declarative programming language, so you don't do really scripting with Kubernetes. There are some scripting commands you can execute, do things, change state, but generally you define a state and let Kubernetes take care to get your application to that state. So when you want to run an application, and here I want to run my front-end application, I have a Docker image named front-end built. And I want to run three instances of it, so it's highly available and performant, whatever. So I will tell Kubernetes that I want to create a deployment of my front end. And that deployment shall have three pods. And the pod in Kubernetes lingo is the unit you deploy in, on, a, on a node. That's the smallest unit you can define for Kubernetes. It will be one or more containers bundled together, kind of. Because it's, very, it's really not a good idea for several reasons to run uh, multiple processes inside one Docker container. Kubernetes allows to do this in a more controlled way. It allows us to run, for example, a monitoring agent next to each instance of our application by bundling it together in a pod. I think whoever is getting confused by that, just think of a pod as a container. Most in the demo, so it's going to be exactly the same. So I want three pods. I create a deployment. Kubernetes will automatically create a, something called a replica set for me, which is also the deployment and the replica set are virtual objects, don't exist physically anywhere on the cluster except in Kubernetes' database. And the replica set will create three pods. And it will talk to the Kubernetes scheduler to decide which nodes to run those pods on. And once I have the pods, I will need to reach them somehow. And they will all have like IP addresses. And how do I reach them? I need a stable IP address. And even better, I need a DNS name to talk to. And that's why I create a service. And that service will give me an endpoint, HTTP slash slash front end. And if I talk to, actually, it's, it's a DNS name. So the service is not some HTTP thing. I just uh, illustrate it like that. So the DNS name called front end will be registered in the cluster's DNS server. and Actually, that's the service discovery part here. So a packet going to front-end will be resolved by the DNS server to the stable IP address of the service, and the service will then route packets to one of the front-end pods. This is called network-level service discovery. Who has worked here with something like Consul or Eureka? Yeah, so you can forget about those things. Kubernetes does that on the network level. No longer need to put anything in your application to do service discovery. And then there are other objects, like batch jobs, stateful sets for databases. Batch job is something that runs every now and then. Daemon set is something that runs one instance of something on every node for usually management reasons. It's really convenient. So there are different, there is, this is the bigger language of Kubernetes. And with this, you can, exp you can describe your distributed application to Kubernetes. So. What I'm going to show you is a re-implementation of the classic video game Doom in using microservices. Imagine, um, so it's going to have a horrible UI because I'm not a front-end developer. 
And I'm actually also not a game developer, so this is just my guesstimate of how probably uh, distributed games work. There is a service that is holding the state of the game, where all the demons are, how actually they are, they don't even have positions, it's just very primitive. Uh, each demon, there is a number of demons, they have health, then there is the player, player has health and the player has ammo. That's pretty much it. And it's not really ready yet, so I think the ammo is not even going down and the demons don't actually hurt the player, but that's not going to be so important. And in the future you can come again to this talk somewhere and it's going to already work better. Uh, the engine is the one that is supposed to move the demons. It's not really doing that yet, but uh, it does execute actions. So the client, when the client says shoot with a shotgun, then the engine calculates how much damage does a shotgun do and updates the state of the world. And then the client reads the state of the world and displays it to the player. So, let's see. I also wanted to show you guys something really awesome I found recently. Um, I don't know who remembers the music of Doom, which would be pretty crappy listening to it now, but there is actually a guy called Andrew Holzholt who have re-implemented the music using a bit more modern uh, thing. Uh, modern music, whatever. So this is how this is the actual music of Doom, just a bit remastered. I think it's fucking awesome. So don't worry, it's not gonna play during the whole demo. Or actually, all right. Good. Everybody is in a doom state of mind, then we can pause the music and oh wait. I said pause. And get on with the demo. Okay, this is way too big. Um, I will turn off the presentation mode and maybe it's completely visible without that and then we don't need to it's it's good, right? Yeah. Okay. So time? How much do I have? Fifteen minutes? 20. Okay. So, here is, I'll actually grab a chair. Here is my Java microservice application. It contains three modules. The Doom client, Doom engine, and the Doom state. It's up on GitHub. I'll be sharing the link. All three are Spring Boot applications. They don't share any code, so one of the principles of microservices is don't, it's not really like don't share any code at all, but try not to share code, because if you cram all your code into the common library, then those will not be independently deployable microservices, but you'll keep breaking one and the other while, uh, while, up so while updating one, you will break the other. So let's first run this application on Kubernetes. How does that work? We have something called a manifest file that describes the deployment I was explaining to you guys. It says I want to run the Doom client. I want to run one replica of the client. Actually, let's run, run three. The Doom client will use the image Doom client version one. It will be checked for readiness on the slash health endpoint. This is how Kubernetes keeps our application always healthy. It doesn't just rely on the process to start up. It actually will be pulling a endpoint, an HTTP endpoint called slash health, which is provided by Spring Boot Actuator in this case, and uh, also a liveness probe. So the readiness probe will be checking whether the service uh, can be sent traffic to, and the liveness probe is checking whether it needs to be killed. Now it's both are looking at the same slash health endpoint, so it's not very different. But uh, yeah, so Kubernetes will kill this service and restart it if, it's, uh, if it becomes unhealthy. And then we are also passing some configuration to our service. We have the, so the, this is the manifest file for the client, right? And uh, 
Here, client needs to talk to engine and also to state. So we are passing in the Doom state service URL and the Doom engine service URL. And we are kind of hard coding them in this manifest file. So we could even move these further away from our manifest files if they would change. But they don't change because we know that if we create a service named Doom state, a DNS name named Doom state will always be available in the cluster, so we are good. Same for the engine. But then the state actually requires a password on every request. There is a basic authentication going on. And I want to store that in a secrets object in Kubernetes, and Kubernetes will inject it, the secret, into the Doom state service password environment variable. And if you look at my Java code, here is the Doom client. And you can see I'm using uh, the value annotation to fetch the environment variables. And this service will actually not start up if they are not available. Right? And this is how I set the environment variables from Kubernetes. And this is how I set the secret environment variables in a very secure way. So because this way, I'm completely detaching my application from the value of the secret. And, I'm, uh, and that way, like an operations person can, can set up that secret. Actually, I will show that as a bit later. Now I will just use a value called uh, client password. So, uh, I have a Docker file and a POM file also. So first I need to build my application for Kubernetes. Building is the, exactly the same as any Docker thing. There are, you, can, you have different ways to build Docker images of Java applications. I don't go too much into it now because I try to focus on Kubernetes. Basically, you can run your normal Maven build, produce an artifact, and then copy that into your Docker image, and that's it. That's very easy. Your, my Docker file here is very tiny. I can control which version of OpenJDK I'm using. That's very nice. Actually, I could like control the whole Linux environment here, but I'm relying on the people maintaining OpenJDK to provide me with a nice image for JDK 10. I copy the Doom client jar in there, and that's, that's my Docker image. It's already built, so we can skip that part now. And I want to set up some kind of playground environment. This is not even the shared development environment. This is just Adam's environment. So I will create a namespace in Kubernetes it's called a namespace, which is an isolated environment. I switch to, actually, I can make this smaller too, I guess, then. And I will tell Kubernetes, kubectl is the client control library for, like, command line tool for, uh, for Kubernetes. So kubectl. Uh, is now looking at the Adam namespace, and I can. I'm here. I'm running a watch, and the watch is telling me it's running this command: kubectl get deployment pod and service. We don't have deployments pods or services, so it says no resources found. Now I go to the Doom client directory, and I say kubectl apply manifest. You can see the command is called apply. It's apply, not create, because I can do this command over and over, and if I change something, then, uh, then I can just reapply the file. I don't need to worry about what's the current state, I just tell it what's the target state. And let's see if the client is starting up. You can see three Doom client pods starting up. They are running, but they are not ready yet. That means the readiness probe has not, the, so the health endpoint did not yet respond. And then we need to debug what's going on. And what we can do, we can exec into the container. Any container running on my cluster, I can run commands on. So I will exec into one of the Doom client pods. And I will run a curl command which needs, curl needs to be installed in there for this to work. And I will run a command inside the container which will check the localhost 8080 slash health. And this is what I get. Um, not found message. That's not what I wanted to get. Mm -hmm. 
Then let's just bash into it and do it from there. But I can skip the debugging part if this is not working. But for developers, this is, I think, really interesting. So curl localhost. Now I'm inside. Now I have a, a terminal inside the container there. Yes. So IO error get request for doom state. OK, so the only problem it has is, no, the, no, I want the health endpoint, sorry. No message available, path slash health. OK, I, oh yeah, I know what's, yes. So now we found out that slash health is actually not, doesn't even exist. So I can go into the POM file and, OK. Last minute changes, so Spring Boot actuator is probably not uh, built into the container because I commented this and now I uncommented it but I did not rebuild it yet so I will rebuild my container build sh the build sh script does very little just a little wrapper for my uh, container for my for uh, maven build command and uh, and docker pack docker build command yes so I have a new Doom client image, version two. So I go to my Doom client manifest and I say I want to run version two. And all I do, you see I edited the file, changed this value there, and now I will tell Kubernetes to apply the changes. And you can see the service was unchanged, but the deployment was configured. And what's happening now is that a new container is being spun, new pod is being spun up here, and if this becomes ready, then the old ones will get killed. So it's doing a rolling upgrade. It's not killing the old version until it sees that the new one is actually healthy. And it's healthy, and the old one is terminating. So it will do a one by one rolling upgrade. Okay. Now, because I don't have that much time, I will skip the same debugging exercise for uh, for Doom Engine. Oh, for uh, sorry, for the Doom State. So Doom State actually, the original problem I wanted to show, but I ac accidentally had another one, was that uh, it checks permissions on the health endpoint, so Kubernetes cannot actually do the health endpoint. So I will build, rebuild my Doom State container with version 2 and change the manifest file again to version 2 of the state and now I'll finally actually run the whole application. So um, before I run the whole application there is an interesting thing here. So you can see the docker file is in my repo which means that the development team has control over the docker file, right? But then there is a question where to put the manifest file. The manifest file kind of contains things that the developers might be responsible for but it's also a bit of an operations thing. So if you put the manifest file next to your application, it will have the effect that you can commit changes to the manifest file and to your application at the same time. So you can one pull request that changes everything, which is really nice. But it also means that, for example, I change the number of replicas here, create a pull request, merge it, and my whole application gets rebuilt just to change the number of replicas. So it also has pretty big downsides. Another way how people manage manifest files is instead of keeping them together in the, uh, with the application. It's a method called GitOps. Uh, it's a new thing because of the nature of declarative manifest files that I can just keep in a repo and can apply them at any time. In the GitOps way, you can see in a single repo, I have a dev directory in which I'm keeping the all three manifest files of all three services. So basically these three manifest files describe a whole environment completely. So I have a dev and a production environment. 
The downside of this is all the duplication I'm having with my YAML files. But I can now say that my development environment will be Doom Client version 2, so now I'm kind of propagating my changes. These are different, I was editing the other YAML files before, so. And also Doom State number 2. And now I will just create the whole development environment. I will move away from this playground. I'm happy I have, I have tested things. So I'll do a kubectl create namespace dev. And I will switch to that namespace cube ns dev. OK, so you can see everything disappeared. I have an empty namespace. And I can go deploy to it by just saying kubectl apply f GitOps per dev, it will apply everything in that directory. So now all my containers are getting created. In the dev environment, we are just running one single client. And hopefully these start up and I can actually show you what an awesome game I made. Maybe I should have just kept one instance running because it's, yeah, Java is a bit slow sometimes. Okay, engine has started up, state is there, we only need a client now. Come on client, oh yeah, it's ready. And here I have the services that are routing traffic to the actual pods. And the engine and the state are cluster IP type services, so they're only accessible from inside the cluster, but client is node port, so it's exposed from the virtual machine where Kubernetes is running now. I forgot to mention that all of this is running on my laptop using Docker for Mac, and that's running a little Kubernetes cluster on my laptop. And because of all the virtual networking magic and Docker and all that, it doesn't matter. It would look exactly the same. You couldn't tell the difference if I was running this on a cluster on some cloud provider. So, we can, I have port 31156 open for the front end. localhost, let's start praying, oh yeah, uh, any front-end developer people close your eyes please now because this is pretty bad, but yeah, and now we will, but yesterday night I implemented the shooting of the demons, there you go, I shot him, his uh, health went down to three, and now I shot him and his health is minus seven and he's dead. I can do this for all of them. Oh look, and actually my ammo is decreasing here. So even that works. It's awesome. So I already see everybody spending long nights uh, with this game. Okay, so if I manage to get the point of GitOps versus keeping the manifest file in your own repo, the Docker file, building your service, I hope that kind of went through. It's a bit rushed with trying to also explain how Kubernetes works in general. Um, but please, I would rather leave time for questions now. So go shoot and ask me to uh, which part to explain better. Uh, let me put it back to the slides. Great. So we have five minutes, I think, for questions.